This chapter 5 examines the next steps in S&P's bank rating methodology, which take us from the determination of the BICRA group to the so-called Standalone Credit Profile, or SACP. To make the discussion livelier in this chapter and in the next one, we will illustrate many of the key points of the S&P methodology by showing their specific application to individual banks. The banks we use for this purpose are BNP Paribas and Goldman Sachs. These have been selected because S&P's ratings reports on them are particularly thorough in our opinion and also because of these firms' importance to the global financial system and the likely familiarity of their business to you. Links to each of these reports can be found in the course outline you can access by clicking on the icon at the bottom left of this video, but you will need a paid subscription to access the full version of these reports. We first reproduce the diagram from Chapter 1, which lays out the progression from the BICRA score to the issuer credit rating and senior unsecured ratings and remind you that the next part of this progression is the incorporation of the bank specific factors into the analysis. The four bank specific factors are business position, capital and earnings, risk position and funding and liquidity. Just before we begin our examination of these four bank-specific factors, we must deal with the case of a bank whose business is spread out among a number of jurisdictions and how such a bank is treated for purposes of BICRA. Quite simply, when a bank is active in more than one country, the economic risk score is calculated as a weighted average of the economic risk scores. The calculation only includes countries where a bank conducts more than 5% of its business, with all weightings rounded to the nearest 5% before averaging. In contrast, a bank's industry risk score is determined by the BICRA industry score for the country where it is domiciled and primarily regulated. The main reason for this is the importance of the bank's home regulatory framework. Take for example the case of BNP Paribas, the French bank whose BICRA group score would be 2 if it operated entirely in France given the 2 score that applies to the French banking system. BNPP's business is spread roughly 60% in France, about 10% each in Belgium, Italy and the US, and about 5% each in Germany and the UK. We note here that the actual report says 30% for France instead of 60%, but we believe this to be a typo. S&P calculates for BNPP a blended economic risk at close to 3 on the 1 to 10 scale for economic risk. This contrasts with the economic risk score of 2 applicable to France. When it comes to the industry risk assessment under BICRA, the 2 score for France automatically becomes the industry risk score for BNPP since this determination is based entirely on the home country's industry risk score. From a bank's economic and industry risk scores, S&P next derives that bank's so-called anchor SACP. This is done in accordance with the table appearing now which prompts the comment from S&P that the single A level is the strongest anchor SACP 
and reflects the volatility of banking even in the strongest markets. By embedding this notion of volatility into the anchor SACP, says Standard & Poor's, it is aiming to ensure that lessons of the post-2007 economic downturn will not be forgotten as national economies recover and another period of favorable conditions gives rise to growth and attractive headline banking profits. You will note that combining the two BNPP scores for each of the economic and industry risk scores results in an anchor SACP of single A- minus for the bank. After the determination of the bank's anchor SACP, S&P's criteria consider each bank-specific SACP rating factor. In other words, an analysis of a bank's individual characteristics. The assessment of each factor, which is done via specific rankings and descriptors, can raise or lower the anchor SACP by one or more notches or have no effect in some cases. The table appearing now illustrates how the anchor SACP is notched on account of the bank's business position, with a very strong business position leading to a two-notch improvement in the SACP versus a five-notch adverse adjustment for a very weak business position. S&P specifies here that the comparative group for this purpose consists of banks with quote-unquote similar industry risk, but is generally limited to those located in the bank's home country. The table appearing now illustrates how the anchor SACP is notched on account of the bank's capital and earnings with a very strong capital and earnings assessment leading to a two-notch improvement in the SACP versus a one-notch to five-notch adverse adjustment for a very weak capital and earnings assessment depending on the bank's anchor SACP. Standard & Poor's specifies here that the comparative group for this purpose consists of, quote, all banks globally, unquote, since globally consistent metrics are used as absolute measures to benchmark performance for the capital and earnings assessment. The table appearing now illustrates how the anchor SACP is notched on account of the bank's risk position with a very strong risk position leading to a two-notch improvement in the SACP versus a five-notch adverse adjustment for a very weak risk position. S&P specifies here that the comparative group for this purpose consists of banks with quote-unquote similar economic risk score and product mix. Finally, the table appearing now illustrates how the anchor SACP is notched on account of the bank's funding and liquidity, with various combinations of funding and liquidity rankings leading to anywhere from a one-notch improvement in the anchor SACP to a five-notch adverse adjustment, and with a number of instances in which caps are imposed on the final SACP. Standard & Poor's specifies here that the comparative group for this purpose consists of all banks in a country for purposes of the funding determination versus all banks globally for purposes of the liquidity determination. For funding, banks are compared with the domestic industry average 
so that this assessment remains consistent with the BICRA funding assessment. While for liquidity, the liquidity sub-factor uses a bank's liquidity ratios and dependence on central bank funding to make a comparison with national and international banks, hence the extension of the peer group to all banks globally. We turn next to more detailed commentary provided by S&P on each of these four SACP rating factors. We begin with business position. S&P views this as the combination of specific features of the bank's business operations that add to or mitigate its industry risk score and groups these features into three sub-factors listed in the first column of the table about to appear. These are business stability, concentration or diversity, and management and corporate strategy. The next two columns provide an explanation of what each of these means and list a number of indicators for evaluating each of these sub-factors. For each bank, the strength of its business position is scored using one of six standard descriptors that will appear in the next table based on conclusions about its strength relative to its peer group. The table for assessing the bank's business position is beginning to appear and you can see already the six standard descriptors in the left column and their short form definitions in the middle column. The last column in the original table which provides guidance on these terms is lengthy and detailed but centers around the following considerations which we have summarized instead whether the strengths on the three sub-factors listed above outweigh the weaknesses or vice versa. How the business compares to others with a similar industry score. Whether the bank required direct government support in the latest financial downturn when other banks did. And how successfully management has executed any restructuring plan associated with government support provided in the latest financial downturn. You will have noted that an adequate business position means that the industry risk score appropriately captures the risk of the bank's business activities. In other words, that when compared to banks with a similar industry risk score, the bank's business activities represent average risk. S&P proceeds to provide useful commentary on each of the sub-factors that underpin a bank's business position. Regarding the first sub-factor, business stability refers to the predictability of continuing business volumes in the face of economic and market fluctuations. Business lines with recurring fee income and net interest income that have a strong annuity characteristic are more stable while the following income sources are identified as less stable. Trading income including interest income from trading activities. Net interest income coming from above average asset liability mismatches. Other market sensitive income and fee income from off-balance sheet financing. Whether business stability supports an adequate or stronger business position or is deemed moderate or weaker is based on how many of the following characteristics the bank has. The customer base is demonstrably sticky and generates a high proportion of revenues. Customers cannot easily switch their business to other providers. 
revenues are less sensitive to market perceptions of credit worthiness. Favorable contractual terms, such as credit-related termination events or triggers, exist in many contracts with customers and counterparties. And the bank is less reliant than the industry on pricing to retain customers. Regarding the second sub-factor, concentration and diversity of business activities are measured by the contributions of different business lines and geographies to a bank's revenues, compared with banks with a similar industry risk. Diversification can be a weakness, however. A bank will weaken its overall business position if it enters new products and countries where it has limited expertise and lacks critical mass to be a real competitor to the incumbent market leaders. You should note that other areas of the criteria also consider concentration but from a different perspective. For example, correlations among risk exposures are analyzed in the upcoming assessment of risk position and concentrations and funding sources are addressed in the upcoming funding and liquidity discussion. Regarding the third sub-factor, management and strategy considers management's ability to execute operational plans in a consistent manner. A bank's strategic direction, management's risk appetite, and the bank's ownership and governance, all of which shape a bank's competitiveness in the marketplace and its financial condition. Whether management and strategy support an adequate or stronger business position, or one that is moderate or weaker, is based on the following characteristics. Whether the bank's risk appetite is more prudent and conservative than average in the industry. And whether there is a track record of avoiding the strategic mistakes of others. Whether returns have been, and are likely to be, less volatile than average in the industry. Whether independent directors have a strong influence and a robust system of checks and balances exists in decision-making. Whether the bank consistently outperforms the sector or country average ROE, particularly during a period of expansion. Whether the entity depends on continuing service from key individuals or from small teams whether compensation schemes encourage short-term profit-taking, whether there is unplanned management turnover in critical senior positions, and lastly, whether the bank has made acquisitions at premium prices. In the case of BNPP, S&P ranks the bank in the very strong category for this factor, identifying the following points in particular. The bank's strong relationships with its clients in the main activities of its business mix, retail, commercial banking, and insurance in its core markets of France, Belgium, and Italy. Second, its solid management and strategy the strength of its corporate and investment banking businesses and other activities in France and abroad, and the quality of its retail franchise, where its greater focus on mass affluent clients than peers largely offsets the bank's smaller than peers market position in the French retail market. Third, the bank's capacity to maintain adequate profitability in all of its business segments in the last cycle. Fourth, the stability of the bank's management and its demonstrated ability to execute well-defined objectives. And five, 
the bank's balanced growth model, combining dynamic organic growth with a steady flow of fairly priced acquisitions, which it integrates successfully. S&P also comments that it does not expect the recent reduction of some CIB activities owing to higher funding and liquidity constraints, particularly in trade and commodity finance, to alter significantly BNPP's very strong business position. The second SACP rating factor is capital and earnings which is analyzed via an assessment of regulatory requirements, projected risk-adjusted capital levels, quality of capital and earnings, and earnings capacity. These various metrics are combined in scoring capital and earnings on the usual six-point scale in accordance with the table beginning to appear now. You will observe that S&P here makes use of its RAC ratio rather than the regulatory capital ratio, that it emphasizes not so much the current RAC ratio but rather the projected capital RAC ratio, that it relies on a notion of earnings buffer to support the bank's capital level as assets and liabilities grow over time and that it emphasizes the importance of high quality capital as a factor that can push a borderline case up one notch or whose absence can have the opposite effect. You will note from this table that a bank with a rack ratio of 8% is classified in the adequate category and that to graduate to the very strong category, the rack ratio needs practically to double. In the second half of the above table, which appears now, diminishing rack ratios gradually pull the classification down to moderate, then weak, and finally to very weak when the projected RAC ratio drops below 3% and the quality of capital and earnings is poor. The remaining discussion provided by S&P on each of these factors is highly technical, extremely detailed and quantitative, and contains numerous caveats and exceptions. To go into it in any detail would overwhelm the person watching this video we will content ourselves with a few key observations that are central to the analysis. First, S&P explains that while RAC is the primary driver of its capital assessments, S&P also uses regulatory capital measures to determine if a bank is at risk of regulatory intervention or worse and caps the SACP to various degrees in cases in which a bank's regulatory capital ratio is below or barely above the designated minimum. Second, S&P emphasizes that capital analysis is closely linked to earnings sustainability since it views earnings as the primary means of absorbing expected through the cycle credit losses leaving to capital the need to absorb unexpected losses, as we explained earlier. Third, S&P stresses the importance of the quality of capital and earnings, allowing for one-notch improvements in classifications when these are especially strong. The following characteristics facilitate the assessment of the quality of capital and earnings. The percentage of a bank's total adjusted capital, or TAC, that is comprised of core capital. The ability and willingness of the bank to sell attractive assets in significant amounts to raise funds that would not require restructuring 
or damage its competitive position. The extent to which the government may have contributed to total adjusted capital but expects repayment when possible. Dividends or planned share buybacks that may prevent the maintenance of strong capital. Revenues that rely on one-off items such as realized capital gains on securities or fixed assets thereby producing a lower level of risk-adjusted core earnings or more volatility in the earnings performance. The extent to which revenues are generated from a relatively narrow business line, especially when net interest income and fees and commissions account for an unusually low percentage of revenues. And any deficiency in loan loss reserves. Fourth, S&P monitors a number of metrics that are indicative of quality of earnings, including the following ratios which suggest improving quality as the ratio increases. Net interest income to total revenue, fees and commissions to total revenue, core earnings to aggregate risk-weighted assets, core earnings to assets, and net operating income before loan loss provisions to assets. Conversely, the following ratios suggest deteriorating quality of earnings as the ratio increases. Trading gains to total revenues other market sensitive income to total revenues, other revenues to total revenues, and finally cost to income ratio. In the case of BNPP, SNP ranks the bank only in the moderate category for this factor given the mere 6.5% to 7% rack ratio the bank was expected to achieve, quote, in the next 18 to 24 months, unquote. S&P views positively the bank's recent commitment to achieve strong Basel III regulatory ratios ahead of the regulatory schedule, in contrast with its former strategy to manage its capital ratios somewhat aggressively. Specifically, a 9% common equity Tier 1 ratio by January 2013 largely through retained earnings and deleveraging. S&P views this target as ambitious but feasible and considers that BNPP is strongly committed to meeting it, as evidenced by its recent announcement of a lower payout ratio and the offer of an equity payment for the 2011 dividend. The bank's pre-tax profit has been declining due to substantial write-downs on Greek sovereign exposure, leading to a ratio of core earnings to revenues at 13% in 2011, which is described as adequate although lower than most peers. Under S&P's criteria, BNPP is hurt especially by two considerations. One, Revisions in S&P's methodology to the type of hybrid instruments that qualify for inclusion in total adjusted capital, particularly those with step-ups, and two, increases in risk-weighted assets that result from changes in its BICRA scores, including the economic risk scores, which took place in early 2012, particularly for trading risk equity holdings, and insurance. These last two points in particular bear a little emphasis. In two tables accompanying the discussion of the bank's capital and earnings measures, SNP explains that it excludes some 7.4 billion euros of hybrid instruments from the 12.6 billion that BNPP reported as of December 31, 2010. 
Furthermore, that it calculates for the bank's equity positions in the banking book a risk-weighted asset equivalent of 120.6 billion euros versus the 22.5 billion calculated by BNPP under Basel II guidelines. Similarly, that it calculates for the bank's trading book a risk-weighted asset equivalent of 49.6 billion euros versus the 17.2 billion calculated by BNPP under Basel II. And finally, that it includes an additional 84 billion euros in risk-weighted assets due to the bank's insurance activities versus the zero figure that arises under Basel II. The net impact of all these differences is to cause the bank's RAC ratio to equal a mere 5.4 percent versus the 11.4 percent calculated under Basel II. The combination therefore of a capital ratio that is not particularly high with earnings that are still suffering from significant write-downs explain the disappointing ranking of quote moderate unquote for BNPP on this factor. The third SACP factor is the bank's risk position which serves to refine the view of a bank's actual and specific risks beyond the conclusion arising from the standard assumptions in the capital and earnings analysis. To differentiate a bank's unique risk position, S&P analyzes five areas. How the bank manages growth and changes in its risk positions. The impact of risk concentrations or risk diversification. How increased complexity adds additional risk. Whether material risks are not adequately captured by the RACF. And evidence of an adequate, strong, or very strong risk position by comparing past and expected losses on the current mix of business with those of peers and with S&P's standard risk assumptions. Greater than average losses may indicate a weaker risk position. The table appearing now provides guidance on how these five considerations are combined to form a single opinion on risk position, the outcome as usual ranging from very strong to very weak. The factors that determine the classification of the bank in the appropriate category are listed next. Management's capacity to manage risks arising from growth or changes in exposure. Management's capacity to manage risks arising from complexity. The degree to which risk diversification dampens the negative impact of economic downturns. Whether the RACF captures all material risk exposures or the diversification benefit outweighs any risk that the RACF misses. How the bank's recent loss experience and prospective loss trend compares to that of peers. And finally, how the bank's loss experience during past economic downturns compares to the average. For example, the original table provides the following guidance for when a bank would earn the moderate assessment for its risk position. Management may not have the capacity to manage risks arising from growth or changes in exposure. Or, either there are material risk concentrations or any risk diversification is more than offset by other higher risk characteristics. Or, management may not have the capacity to manage risks arising from complexity. Or, the RACF misses material risk exposures. Or, the bank's recent or progressive losses are greater than peers. Or, finally, the bank's loss experience during the past economic downturns was worse than average and risk appetite, controls and management have not noticeably improved. 
SNP next provides a very useful example to illustrate how the risk position assessment combines with the capital and earnings assessment to alter the anchor SACP. Both Bank A and Bank B have a healthy earnings buffer and adequate quality of capital, and both maintain regulatory capital ratios comfortably above the regulatory requirement. However, Bank A has an 11% projected RAC ratio and Bank B a 6% projected RAC ratio. Therefore, the capital and earnings criteria view Bank A as strong and Bank B as moderate. Following fundamental risk analysis, it becomes evident that Bank A's loss experience is more volatile than peers. While its risk management looks good, many products are complex. There are large derivatives exposures, a large and risky private equity portfolio, and a narrow focus on advisory services, structured credit, and proprietary trading. Bank A, therefore, has a quote-unquote moderate risk position. Bank B has a quote global retail and commercial franchise with market leading positions in all of its business units. The products are simple. Off balance sheet activity is low and all derivatives hedge customer driven business. The bank has grown steadily through time and often at a slower pace than aggressive competitors. Volatility is lower and losses are consistently less than average. Notably, Bank B continued reporting profits during the previous two downturns. Bank A, Bank B, beg your pardon, has a very strong risk position. The moderate and very strong conclusions about risk position modify the moderate and strong capital and earnings conclusions about Bank A and Bank B. All other things being equal, the effect of these two factors is to leave the anchor SACP unchanged for Bank A versus for Bank B a one-notch improvement to its anchor SACP. S&P next provides useful color on the five considerations for the assessment of the bank's risk position, which we summarize next. Management has the capacity to manage risks associated with growth and changes in exposure when a bank is displaying one or more of the trends below. Showing lower recent organic or acquisitive growth and modest prospects for future growth than in the past and compared with peers with a similar economic risk score when the lower growth is based on avoiding risk and declining riskier growth opportunities that other banks are willing to take. Maintaining underwriting standards despite competitive pressures. Reducing its risk exposure, for example by exiting risky activities or tightening underwriting standards. Remaining focused on serving its core customer base with traditional expertise and limiting opportunistic proprietary activities. Refraining from new product, customer, or market activities outside of its traditional area of expertise. or keeping a similar portfolio of risks that limited losses experienced in previous economic downturns. There is a risk diversification benefit when a bank has the following. The RACF adjustment for concentration and diversification indicates a reduction in Standard & Poor's risk-weighted assets the exposure to counterparties for derivatives and other trades as a share of total 
risk-weighted assets is diversified and not material. Geographic diversification arises from exposures that are clearly connected with a client franchise abroad and not from opportunistic product, tax, regulatory, or currency arbitrage. And sector or risk type diversification arises from operations in activities that are no more risky than the bank's traditional core business. Regarding complexity, S&P worries about giving too much credit for diversification to those highly complex institutions that are most difficult to manage, or over penalizing smaller, less complex institutions for concentration risk. S&P considers management to be exposed to additional risks associated with complexity when a bank has one or more of the following. Business lines with complex products such as derivatives, securitizations, and structured credit such as collateralized debt obligations, CDOs, that are important to the overall group. Limited transparency into underlying risk positions, risk management, or earnings generation. A siloed approach to risk management, which may hinder a consistent measurement and management of risk exposure. Material dependence on mathematical models and their underlying, often complex assumptions to measure and manage risk and to value assets and liabilities. A portfolio that contains risks with a low probability of occurrence but high loss severity otherwise known as tail risk. Balance sheet strategies that are driven by regulatory arbitrage and operations in many jurisdictions or with an organizational structure with many legal entities which may grow beyond management's capacity to control. Turning to risks that the RACF may not cover, S&P highlights two such risks in particular. The first of these relates to certain volatile pension exposures not already captured by the adjustments to total adjusted capital that were mentioned in Chapter 4. The second key risk relates to interest rate and currency risks in the banking book, including structural interest rate risk which arises naturally from business lines such as mortgage lending and strategic interest rate risk which the asset liability management or ALM function maintains and manages. Analysis of interest rate risk includes a review of some or all of the following. The sensitivity of a bank's projected earnings to changes in interest rates or the shape of the yield curve based on its own stress testing. Senior management's engagement and awareness for setting and managing the amount of interest rate risk. The degree of maturity gap between repricing assets and liabilities and the adequacy of a bank's risk management based on a review of its scenario and stress testing optionality characteristics of assets or liabilities with prepayment or extension options or other behavioral characteristics that differ from contractual ones. In the case of BNPP, a strong assessment for risk position is deemed appropriate on account of the bank's strong diversification of its risk exposure and its recent loss experience. Evidence that the bank's risk exposure is particularly well diversified comes from the 25% diversification benefit of the RAC ratio as well as from the low level of concentration of single names and sectors in the loan book. S&P adds that BNPP has demonstrated in the past four years its robust risk position and enterprise risk management 
and the risk appetite that is viewed by S&P as lower than peers. Perhaps more instructive here is S&P's commentary on the risk position of Goldman Sachs. Although we should point out that the research report on which this is based precedes the rollout date of S&P's bank rating methodology in November 2011, although we do not believe this would affect much of what is stated in the Goldman report. Recognizing that Goldman makes markets in a wide variety of securities and commodities, including high-risk, less liquid assets, such as distressed debt and emerging market securities, which can be very profitable because of larger spreads and fees in these markets, S&P worries nonetheless that these expose the company to particularly high market and credit risks. Yet S&P finds that despite its aggressive risk appetite, Goldman has been highly adept at exploiting trading opportunities while avoiding the severe problems encountered by the majority of its peers. For example, those stemming from exposures to asset-backed collateralized debt obligations, or CDOs. According to S&P, Goldman's senior management recognizes the importance of risk management and is thoroughly involved in reviewing trading strategies and monitoring large exposures. The company's policy of continually marking to market the balance sheet is a strength, allowing it to incorporate market trends and risk exposures into real-time risk reduction actions. S&P cites three additional factors for the firm's successful risk management – communication, escalation, and accountability. Looking at credit risk, S&P notes that loans held by Goldman for the long term are generally investment grade, whereas those held for syndication or sell-down include non-investment grade loans. While the company does not maintain an inordinately large portfolio of corporate loans, its credit exposure rose significantly in 2006 and through mid-2007 due to competition for leveraged lending business, which enabled corporate clients to obtain funding commitments in return for awarding investment banking and other assignments. With the market repricing of credit risk that began abruptly in mid-2007, Goldman, like its peers, was stuck with a substantial amount of debt it could not readily sell, causing write-downs from leveraged lending alone of about $5 billion. Goldman is also exposed to credit risk from its activities as prime broker to hedge funds, including the financing of the fund's securities holdings and the lending to them of securities to facilitate short sales. But these do not concern S&P much since they are virtually always collateralized with closely monitored margins. Finally, Goldman's derivatives business gives rise to substantial credit risk, which had reached $8.1 billion as of September 2010 net of collateral to non-investment grade or unrated counterparties alone. Goldman's use of VAR, scenario analysis, stress tests, and other analytical tools for the measurement of market risk are cited approvingly by S&P, with some of the usual limitations about VAR's inability to quantify worst-case potential loss. In any event, S&P finds that Goldman's VAR, typically in the $100 million to $200 million range, is within acceptable levels. Turning finally to operational risk, S&P judges Goldman to face a relatively high degree of operational risk, including losses from shortcomings in internal control processes, system failures, 
and reputational risk from negative publicity or litigation. On this last point, S&P cites in particular the firm's $550 million settlement with the SEC involving claims that the firm had made materially false and misleading statements to investors relating to a 2007 CDO offering and a number of other lawsuits alleging breach of fiduciary duty and securities fraud, among other charges. All of this makes likely continued close scrutiny by regulators in the opinion of S&P. The last of the four factors that enable the transition from the anchor SACP to the final SACP is funding and liquidity. Addressing funding first, S&P centers its analysis on a comparison of the strength and stability of a bank's funding mix according to several metrics with the domestic industry average. A bank develops a mix of funding resulting from its strategic choices about what products and services to offer and risk management decisions about what funding options to use given the availability of stable core deposits or term funding and riskier short-term wholesale funding. The criteria begin the assessment using the bank's loan to deposit ratio, long-term funding ratio, reliance on short-term wholesale funding and overall funding mix. The table appearing next shows how S&P ranks banks within a country's banking industry according to these metrics and compares them against the industry average weighted by assets. The three possible classifications are above average, average and below average and these are determined by use of the following criteria. How well established, stable and diversified a source of retail funding the bank has. For example, a deposit franchise with a high proportion of insured balances. How diversified the funding sources are by tenor and how appropriate for the asset profile. How confidence sensitive the funding is, i.e. how much the bank relies on potentially more sensitive non-resident deposits or market leading pricing to attract and retain balances. How much short-term funding in domestic or cross-border capital markets the bank uses versus the industry average. And generally how diversified the funding is across stable sources as compared to the bank's peers. Turning to liquidity, S&P focuses carefully on the bank's relative dependence on central bank funding and its ability to access other liquidity sources, commenting that liquidity becomes progressively weaker as an institution increasingly relies on funding support from the monetary authorities. The table appearing next shows how S&P classifies banks' liquidity position in one of six categories ranging from strong to very weak, defining each ranking by reference to how long the bank can survive under stressful conditions and how much use of central bank funding it is likely to need. The table also provides guidance on how to determine these rankings by means of the following considerations. The strength of liquidity ratios and market indicators compared with other banks in the same country. The ratio of short-term sources of liquidity to short-term uses. How long the bank can survive without access to market funding whether the bank can access unsecured funding, how quickly risk management responds to growth in more sensitive funding sources, the existence of contingency plans for adverse conditions 
including the pledging of collateral with the central bank to raise liquidity. The amount of large or unusual liquidity needs in the next 12 to 24 months. Whether the bank applies comprehensive stress scenarios to identify the full range and size of contingent liabilities and whether contingent liabilities are material, easily identified and well captured. S&P next explains that its liquidity analysis includes non-contractual or reputational contingencies arising from management's perceived need to preserve franchise value. Examples include the repurchase of commercial paper in advance of maturities, calling long-term debt at the first call date despite having no contractual obligation to do so, the provision of support to money market funds, securitizations, tender option bonds, and auction rate securities, or support of secondary markets and assets as a market maker. S&P states that the criteria rarely treat liquidity for a bank as strong, even when its management is solid since a key source of contingent liquidity is based on support from the central bank or monetary authorities, which means that banks are not entirely self-supporting. High leverage and mismatched maturities of assets and liabilities make banks confidence sensitive, an essential condition that permits the bank to avoid repaying all deposit liabilities on their contractual maturity date. As a central part of contingency planning for such an event, many banks rely on support from the central authorities. In all but the most exceptional cases, therefore, SNP considers this reliance on third parties acceptable for an adequate assessment at best. S&P concludes the section on liquidity by listing the potential sources and uses thereof that it takes into account to determine if the balance between the two is appropriate. S&P's analysis assesses the following potential uses of cash to determine a bank's contractual and contingent short-term obligations. Deposit runoff and withdrawal. Deposit stability takes into account Deposit composition, insured versus uninsured, international versus domestic, corporate versus retail, relationship based versus rate based. In each case, the first is more stable than the second. Runoff of other customer funds, e.g., prime broker free credit balances. Drawdown of credit commitments. The ability of the bank to reduce limits and the extent of undrawn commitments to customers. The maturity profile of wholesale liabilities. Inability to roll over short-term unsecured borrowings, e.g. commercial paper, certificates of deposit, promissory notes, or to refinance maturing long-term unsecured debt. Market-driven inability to roll over maturing short-term secured debt or repurchase agreements. That is, the market can dry up altogether for lower quality securities or, short of that, seek increased margins, collateral requirements or credit spreads. Company-specific credit-driven increases in margin and collateral requirements for example resulting from a breach of rating triggers. Settlement frictions as counterparties increasingly dispute mark-to-market valuations and delay payments. Inability to refinance maturing securitizations backed by revolving assets. Calls under guarantees to unrelated third parties such as standby letters of credit 
performance guarantees, securities lending indemnifications, and custody guarantees. Support payments to affiliates, including those that regulations require, guarantees, and keep well or support agreements. Capital commitments under joint ventures. And finally, penalties resulting from regulatory sanctions and judgments or settlements relating to litigation. S&P similarly assesses the following potential sources of liquidity with particular attention paid to its dependability. Drawdown of unrestricted cash and short-term deposits. System-wide liquidity facilities at central banks or other government sources, both routine and extraordinary, determined by unencumbered assets that the central bank would qualify as collateral and liquidity available in exchange for these assets after central bank haircuts. Drawdown of committed credit facilities subject to financial covenants and headline considerations. The sale or repo of unencumbered high-quality liquid securities in the open market. Within corporate groups, the ability to access funds from affiliates in the form of advances or capital, subject to regulatory and covenant restrictions. liquidation of short-term advances to other financial institutions and reverse repos. Cash available from maturing advances to customers. Accessing the debt and stock markets to the extent still possible. Accessing securitization or covered bond markets through established facilities or asset sales programs. And finally, whole loan sales. With regard to BNPP, funding is deemed average by SNP in line with domestic and most international peers, despite deterioration since mid-2011 when the Eurozone crisis intensified. BNPP relies on wholesale funding because its loan book slightly exceeds its customer deposits and capital markets funding. As a result of challenging capital markets from mid-2011, BNPP accelerated its strategic reviews of its businesses and started significant deleveraging actions, partly in preparation for the upcoming Basel III capital and liquidity regulations. The bank reduced its U.S. dollar funding needs by 30% within six months by sharply reducing its trading and financing activities in dollars. Still, SNP considers that BNPP's funding benefits from stable and cheap customer deposits in domestic retail activities, a significant presence in businesses such as retail banking abroad, private banking, and security services that generate additional deposits, and highly diversified wholesale funding sources in terms of support and geography, with a strong private placement capacity and an overall moderate level of encumbered assets. BNPP's liquidity is also deemed adequate by SNP. The bank maintains large liquidity reserves, mainly comprising securities eligible for central bank financing, and periodically adjusts it using liquidity stress tests. On December 31, 2011, unencumbered assets eligible for central bank refinancing amounted to $105 billion in addition to deposits of $55 billion with central banks. S&P's report on Goldman Sachs is again particularly instructive for what it says about the firm's funding and liquidity. Like other companies with large-scale trading operations and sizable inventories of securities, 
Goldman traditionally has relied heavily on secured wholesale funding sources, mostly of a relatively short duration. Because Goldman has an almost constant need to raise funds in the capital markets, it is subject to sudden losses of confidence among its funding sources during market turmoil. According to S&P, Goldman coped relatively well with the fear-driven market conditions that prevailed in late 2008 and early 2009, helped by the high esteem in which it is held by market participants, its above average earnings, and conservative liquidity management. Despite this, extraordinary government support underpinned its funding stability from September 2008 through early 2009. Importantly, in response to unstable market conditions, Goldman significantly increased its excess liquidity. Its global core excess, or GCE, averaged $173 billion during the third quarter of 2010, up from an average of $51 billion during 2006. The GCE represents pre-funding of the cash requirements Goldman estimates it would need in a liquidity crisis. It is held in the form of highly liquid securities that may be sold or pledged to provide same-day funds principally in U.S. government and agency securities and highly liquid mortgage securities, all of which are Federal Reserve repo eligible and in overnight cash deposits plus some French, German, UK and Japanese government bonds and overnight cash deposits in Euros, British Pounds and Japanese Yen. S&P believes Goldman's excess liquidity could diminish somewhat as market conditions improve, though new regulatory regimes such as Basel III will require a greater level of excess liquidity than in the past. In sizing its GCE, Goldman considers upcoming maturities of unsecured debt and letters of credit, potential buybacks of a portion of its outstanding unsecured debt, adverse changes in the terms or availability of secured funding, derivatives and other margin and collateral outflows, including those due to market movements, potential cash outflows associated with its prime brokerage business, draws on its unfunded commitments, and upcoming cash outflows such as tax and other large payments. The average maturity of the firm's long-term unsecured debt is about seven years. Goldman meets the bulk of its securities inventory funding needs with secured borrowings, including repos. Goldman relies on overnight repos only for its highest quality securities. The average age of its secured funding book is longer than 100 days with the more difficult to fund assets having the longest repo terms. This brings us finally to the end of this chapter 5.